Chapter 2 She watched TV and sewed like most nights. A half-finished piece of birthday cake rested on the table before her, its accompanying fork encrusted in crumbs and white and pink frosting. She dragged on her cigarette, the orange tip glowing brighter as she pulled, then released a thick cloud of smoke. The smell of it matched that of the room. It was time. Young Joe closed his hands behind his back, cleared his throat, and checked in the hallway mirror to make sure his collar was clean. A single white string lay against his black sweater. He angrily pulled it off. Then he swallowed and stepped into the living room. Mom? His second-to-last foster mother turned her head. Her smile was seeped in that straight, honest caring Joe knew was for him. Hey, baby. She beckoned him with her head. Come here and have some cake. Joe walked up to her, though he didn't join her on the couch. She held out the plate with the cake, and he politely declined. You sure? You've been looking skinny lately. Joe shook his head. Without a word, he pulled his hands from behind him and offered them toward her. The small box, wrapped in birthday paper of blues and reds and yellows, looked like a mosaic of colored affection against his palms. Her eyebrows raised. For me? She asked. Joe, sweetheart, you didn't have to. Joe smiled. His second-to-last foster mother carefully picked the box from his hands and unwrapped it. She placed the white cardboard lid gently on the table and reached in. She inhaled sharply as she pulled a tiny crystal rabbit from the box's cotton-filled interior. Joe! She turned to him with wide eyes. You got this for me? Joe shrugged and smiled. The rabbit was her Chinese zodiac sign. She liked knickknacks, and he'd seen it in the store window. He'd saved his Arcadian for a month to buy it. Sweetheart, did you pick this yourself? Joe nodded. When he'd finally gotten enough money, the price had raised. He'd gone into the store and stared at the rabbit and thought he'd cry. You went out and got me a birthday present? Joe nodded. The men in the store had been really mean and had yelled at Joe for being there without a parent. You didn't have to. Joe shrugged. He'd wanted that rabbit and hated that man and loved her. His second-to-last foster mother crammed her cigarette into her ashtray and pulled Joe in for a great big hug. You're such a sweetheart. She cooed into his ear, rocking him back and forth as her hair brushed his cheek. She smelled of flowers and cigarettes and not at all of alcohol. You're the best kid ever, you hear me? Joe slid his arms around her. He just slipped the rabbit in his pocket, slipped it in and left the store. Joe smiled. She was happy and it had been easier than he'd thought it would be. Joe took a long drag on his cigarette and leaned his back against an unmanned bar. Things were going perfectly. Perfectly. He couldn't remember the last night he'd done so well. If he had to calculate it in his head, he figured he was already 50,000 yen richer, and that didn't count all the money he'd made at school. If Joe worked that club right, he could return every few months and really clean up. He jammed his cigarette butt in a nearby ashtray and dispersed thick smoke from his nostrils. He found himself face to higher face with Sachi. The tall classmate waggled a bottle of soda and smiled at Joe. Hey! He gestured to his drink. Can I buy you one? Joe actually winced. That's it, he thought in resignation. This guy can't be real. But Joe was in a good mood. The kids in that club were, unknowingly, treating him already. He figured he would cut Sachi some slack. Sachi was just new at taking people out, right? It was the beginning of high school, a lot of his classmates didn't know squat about dating. Maybe if Joe gave Sachi some pointers, things would be less humiliating for all involved. I don't need you buying me anything, Sachi, Joe lectured. Save it for that girl you've got the painfully obvious hots for. ISA or whatever, right? He pushed another cigarette between his lips and searched his pocket for his lighter. I don't know why you're ditching her for me right now. What was even the point of tonight? Sachi's eyebrows furrowed slightly. I'm not ditching her, he said. I just wanted to give her some space. I left her with Kiyoshi. Joe sighed. You left her, he repeated. With Kiyoshi. Sachi nodded. Unbelievable. Joe touched the edge of the flame to his cigarette and snapped the lighter shut. Sachi, he mumbled around the stick. Maybe you're not good at sizing up threats, so let me do it for you. You're not ugly or anything, but Kiyoshi is better looking than you. I'm better looking than you. The very, very first rule of dating is don't ask a girl out and invite two other guys who are better looking than you. He dragged deeply, released. And don't leave her with one to try and buy drinks for the other. How could you possibly think that's productive? Sachi paused a moment. I don't... productive? He frowned. Joe, this wasn't meant to be a date with her. You were flirting with her all day. I wasn't flirting. Yes, you were. Sachi put down his drink. I was trying to make friends. He responded, slight frustration behind his voice. Like I'm trying to make friends with you. Joe sighed. He puffed on his cigarette. Fine, he said at last. Whatever. He was starting to come to the conclusion that Sachi, although painfully naive, wasn't the same kind of naive Joe had assumed. It probably wasn't worth his effort. 
Besides, he thought, I've listened to him talk enough for one day. Sachi sipped from his drink and said nothing. Joe smoked. A throng of teenage dancers pulsed to the throbbing bass line. Joe took a long drag again, allowing his eyes to roam the club as the warm poison filled his lungs. A cynical part of him wondered if ISA was making out with some other dude in a corner somewhere. She'd already gotten the three guys to take her to a club on the first day of school. Maybe she was more of a man-eater than her attitude implied. It would certainly be the cherry on top of Sachi's efforts that day. But Joe didn't see her. As Joe's smoke swirled in front of his eyes, he came to the conclusion that she'd either gone to the bathroom or left entirely. Joe? Sachi asked after a moment. Yeah? He took a breath. Do you really think Kiyoshi's good looking? Like to girls? Joe rolled his cigarette from one side of his mouth to the other. He's a jock, right? Jocks can always get laid. Besides, the overgrown hair and puppy dog eyes make him non-threatening. Sachi set down his glass. You sound like you know a lot about this kind of thing. More than you, Joe thought. That's not saying much. Hmm. Sachi scratched his chin. I guess that's a good thing for Kiyoshi. He's sort of got his eye on someone. Sachi sighed. You're his roommate, Joe. Maybe you can help him. Sure, Joe dismissed. Whatever you say. He didn't add, to be polite, that he had countless better ways to spend his precious time. Aisei's head hurt. She slowly lifted her eyelids, then shut them to stop the world from spinning. She swallowed the bile in her throat. It was hot wherever she was. Hot and cramped. She was nearly upright, her legs sprawled in uncomfortable positions, and her hands bound behind her back. Something solid but soft rested against her cheek, and it rose and fell almost in tune with her breathing. She could vaguely remember getting grabbed and hit in the head. She tasted blood on her teeth. She at last managed to open her eyes. She was in a tiny, dark space where a few bare slits of light glowed from a grate in the metal door. She gingerly turned her head and made out the shape of a broom leaning against the wall. Based on her position and the smell of cleaning fluid, she figured she was in a janitorial locker or something. She rested her head against the moving softness and closed her eyes. She was still dizzy, and she found it oddly comforting. It was a little warm, and it gave great relief to her spinning head. It was only the back of her mind that murmured she was probably resting against a breathing person, a male chest if she didn't know better, and Kiyoshi's unconscious body if she had to guess. When she finally listened to her intuition and jerked back, she did indeed recognize that shirt. Even in the dark, she could see Kiyoshi's head resting awkwardly in a corner, and the fact that she was squashed against him so tightly that her thighs were straddling one of his. Color flooded to her face instinctually. Damn. She tried to squirm herself off him, but any movement with her hands bound resulted in her legs tightening around him. She quickly gave that up. It wasn't like there was anywhere to squirm to, and she was uncomfortable enough without accidentally grinding him. With the fog in her head finally dispersed, her mind raced. What the hell had happened? Where were they? She could vaguely make out voices on the other side of the locker, and it made her heart pound in her ears. Had she and Kiyoshi gotten too close to something they weren't supposed to overhear? She swallowed and tried to listen to anything she could make out. After a moment, she realized the heartbeat throbbing in her ears was on a slightly different beat from another dull pulse that bled through the walls. Techno music. It was a slight relief. She wasn't tied up on a boat and being shipped into slavery or anything. She tried to grasp at that straw of good news as she wriggled against whatever was binding her hands. Kiyoshi suddenly moaned. Aise froze. Several points and counterpoints flashed through her head. Should they make noise and try to get help? But what if whoever was on the other side of the locker had put them in there in the first place? She stared at Kiyoshi, praying with everything she had that he would wake up quietly. But he didn't wake up at all. He simply stirred, mumbled some not words, and murmured a single name. My. Ayase held her breath. <laughs> Kiyoshi made a little grunt before finally settling down. He went silent once more, his breathing falling into its previous unhindered rhythm. Thank you. Ayase swallowed. She didn't know who Mai was, and frankly, she didn't care. She needed to get her hands free before anything else happened. She stopped at that. There was a way to... She watched Kiyoshi carefully for a moment, determined to diagnose his state of sleep. It really did seem like he was still out cold. His deep breathing indicated he was oblivious to her presence and probably would be for a while. Ayase took a breath. Then do it, her mind calmly stated. He won't see you. It made sense, she knew, but Ayase still felt acid swirl in her stomach. She bit her lip. It wasn't like she had much of a choice. Slowly, carefully, she closed her eyes and relaxed her bound hands. Go. Her fingertips began to dissolve. Slowly at first, the particles of her body that broke free took on the form of small, shining insects, near silent and uniform under her command. 
First her fingers dissolved into bugs, then her palms, then her wrists, until the closet filled with dozens of them. The cord that bound her fell to the floor as the wrists it bound scattered into the air. When she was free, she mentally pulled the insects back to her body, and they quickly returned and reformed into her missing hands. She let out the long breath she'd unwittingly held. She shifted carefully so she could stretch her hands out before her and flex the fingers. Fine. She was fine. It hadn't hurt a bit. That wasn't too bad, she thought, as her nerves slowly began to settle. She had to admit that she hadn't really known if it would work. She'd only intentionally turned her body into insects a few times in her life, but it had been as easy and natural as she'd feared. She dropped her hands and swallowed. There was no more time to hesitate. It took her a minute or two to free Kiyoshi. She needed to roll his back to her and contort very oddly so she could use her teeth to tear his cord. She felt around the back of his head and brushed a bump there, but no blood. She positioned his back against the wall again as silently as she could. Kyoshi, she whispered very, very quietly. She shook him gently. Kyoshi, wake up! He moaned and turned his head. She turned it back to her and leaned close. Kyoshi, come on! I never could. Couldn't. Ayase paused, but he was clearly just dreaming. It wasn't time for that. She furrowed her eyebrows and shook harder. Kyoshi! She hissed in his face. Come on, you have to... Mm. He suddenly surged forward and kissed her. Despite her brain's shrieking protest, she was still too shocked to react in time. His body crushed into her, sending them back to slam against the door of the locker. Nothing? Joe shook his head. He checked the bathrooms, but with no luck. He watched as Sachi worriedly bit his thumbnail. Joe, getting bored with Sachi's drama, lit up another cigarette. I think something happened to them, Sachi said at last. Joe rolled his eyes. I can't believe I still have to spell it out for this guy, he thought. Sachi, Joe murmured around his cigarette. She ditched, all right? Kyoshi probably took her home. Neither of them looked very happy to be here. Sachi shook his head. She wouldn't do that. You don't know her, Sachi. Joe started to get annoyed. I don't know what your experience with girls is. Probably non-existent if I had to guess, he added silently. But if a chick's uncomfortable on a first date, she reserves the right to sneak away. He dragged, released. Date rapes and all that. It sucks, but it's not your call. She wouldn't leave without saying anything. Why not? Sachi turned to Joe quickly. Because she's not that kind of girl, he said bitterly. Okay. You don't know what kind of girl she is. I just know. Joe sighed. Whatever, he breathed irritably. He dragged deep on his cigarette and let it out as Sachi pointed to somewhere behind him. Did you check that hallway? He asked. No. Smoke tumbled over lips. It looks like it's for employees or something. Sachi started off toward the hall. Joe was unimpressed with Sachi's incredibly misguided chivalry, but Joe didn't know his way back to school yet, so he was stuck with the guy. He followed his tall classmate with the hope that another failed search might force him to accept reality. The hallway was long, and after a few turns, Joe wanted to head back. It was a waste of time, and he didn't trust it. Winding hallways at the back of clubs could lead to trouble, and it was the kind of place where people get mugged or worse. Sachi. Joe tapped the ashes off his cigarette. They're not here, okay? We should go. We're not leaving till we checked everywhere. Sachi resolutely continued toward another turn. Joe felt a pang of anger and fear shoot off in his stomach, and he reached out and grabbed Sachi's arm. Sachi, he said as calmly as he could. Come on. Sachi froze. He turned to Joe, a strange look in his eyes. Wait. Sachi reached out and touched Joe's shoulder. W what's bothering you? Joe had to stop a second at that. He hadn't... He hadn't sounded that nervous, had he? Joe nudged from Sachi's hold. Nothing, he said, and he certainly sounded convincing in his own ears. I just don't think that... Are you lost? Sachi and Joe turned. A very, very large man stepped from around the corner and stared straight down at them. Joe swallowed. The guy stood head and shoulders taller than Sachi, and his frame, clothed in a long sleeve shirt and pair of cargos, was clearly massive. His baseball cap and sunglasses all but confirmed the danger alarms ringing in Joe's head. I knew it. Sorry, Joe muttered, nudging Sachi with a heel. We took a wrong turn. Have you seen anyone come down here? It took all of Joe's willpower to not smack the determined look off Sachi's face. The man was trouble, and he didn't ask trouble questions. Joe quickly pulled a cigarette from his mouth to negate Sachi's comment, but Sachi continued before Joe could intervene. There's a girl and a boy missing, about our age, both wearing t-shirts. Sachi reached out and touched the man's arm. Have you seen them? Joe froze. Touch the man? Touch him? 
He was too dumbfounded by Sachi's stupidity to say a word. The man irritably slapped Sachi's hand off. Nobody's been down here, he said darkly. Now beat it. Are you sure? The man's eyebrows lowered. N never mind, Joe stuttered, his hand closing hard on Sachi's arm. We're leaving. I don't want to get my ass kicked tonight, he thought as he started to pull. Sachi surprisingly led him. Joe half dragged his companion down the hallway as fast as he could walk. When Sachi leaned in, Joe didn't have the patience. Joe? Shut the hell up. Joe kept his voice low. Keep walking. Sachi shut his mouth for the first time since Joe had met him. When the two of them finally made it around a far corner and out of earshot, Joe whipped to Sachi. What the hell were you trying to do back there? Joe hissed. Sachi, that guy was dirty. Dirty. I don't care what you're looking for. You never, ever give a dirty man that big a hard time. Sachi furrowed his eyebrows. I know he was iffy, but... But nothing, asshole. Joe couldn't believe how honestly scared he was. It had been a while since he'd encountered danger. One of the perks of being a thief was the lack of confrontation. He fumbled through his pockets for a cigarette. Sachi stared back in the direction they'd come from. After a moment, he looked down at his hand. You're crazy, Joe continued. Out of your goddamn mind. He shakily tipped the end of his lighter to his stick before snapping the flame away. That guy could have palmed your head, dickwad. As Joe puffed nervously, he noticed that the hand Sachi examined was the one he'd used to touch the man. After a moment, Sachi pushed it at Joe. Did that look like blood to you? Joe had had it. He flicked his cigarette and knocked Sachi's arm away. Look, Sachi, I don't know you. It's great you want to bond and then be brave and badass and all that, but I don't take a dump with my goddamn eyes closed. I know shit when I see it. Joe pointed behind him. That is shit, and I'm not getting involved in that for anyone, let alone a kid I met today. Sachi paused. So you're not going to help me? He asked, his tone careful. I'll find my own way home. Joe pocketed his sunglasses. And believe me, Kyoshi and that chick left. Get the hell out of here if you know what's good for you. Joe angrily turned and started down the hall. Probably three seconds passed before he heard Sachi start to run. Back toward the man in the shades. Joe cursed the most creative swear he knew and took off like a bullet after. Did you hear something? What? Where? In the locker, man. It's still locked. Who cares? Kyoshi's eyes slowly opened. They stared dazedly into Ayase's own, then shot wide in shock. What? Ayase slapped a hand over Kyoshi's mouth. She shook her head furiously, half in message and half to clear the blood flooding her face. She quickly but carefully pushed him off her until his back was against the wall. Quiet, she hissed in his ear. She felt Kyoshi swallow against the palm of her hand. He nodded, clearly confused. That was close. Ayase forced herself to calm down. Based on what she'd overheard, the people outside the locker were the enemy. She had to work fast. Ayase carefully twisted toward the door and placed her hands against the cool metal. Pressing her eye to the grate, she could make out a few young men hunched over something. She felt Kyoshi squirm his arms. He was rubbing feeling back into his hands, assumedly. His knee knocked into a metal bucket and made more sound than she liked, so she whipped her head to him and pressed a finger to her lips. Did I kiss you? His whisper was sudden and awkward. Even in the darkness, she could see the nervous look in his eyes. Ayase gritted her teeth. Not the time, her mind snapped. Willing to spare him no more than a few seconds, she leaned into his ear. Don't worry about it, she breathed. Just be quiet. He looked pale in the dark. He half bowed his head to her, raised his fingers to his nose, and mouthed an apology. Despite having more important things to worry about, she did feel a little better at seeing his embarrassment. She nodded and returned to the grate. At least he didn't mean it, she reminded herself as her nerves settled a bit more. Another person stood in the room now, a high schooler it looked like, with short bleached hair. She listened carefully to the muted voices, but even without them she could guess the situation. How much? 2,000 for the white, 3,000 for the blue. That much? Hey, take it or leave it. The student with bleached hair scowled. She jammed her hand into her pocket and pulled out a wad of cash. Three of those. You sure that's all you got? Aise pulled back from the door. Kyoshi still looked more confused than concerned, but she couldn't blame him. He hadn't woken up with his hands tied. She wasn't sure if she could explain their situation or not. Muted yelling and a loud bang suddenly erupted from elsewhere. Aise froze. She heard the men outside her door curse and shuffle and start running. She didn't know where the distraction came from, but she recognized it as a potential opportunity. She quickly pushed her eye against the grate, then jerked back when she saw a man running right toward them. She grabbed Kyoshi's hand. Run, she breathed. When that door opens, run and call the cops as fast as you can. 
Kyoshi blinked. Uh, okay. The lock clicked, and the door flew open. Joe wished, not for the first time, that he had no morals. Sure, he was a pickpocket for a living, and half of Tokyo would donate to his cigarette fund if he had anything to do with it, but he wasn't a monster. He could have left Sachi, for example. Left the moron to push his own luck and get his own ass dumped in an alley. Joe didn't know Sachi a thing, and it wasn't like he hadn't tried to help the guy leave well enough alone. But no, something instinctual had pulled Joe back. He'd simply turned and run and jumped into action when he'd seen Sachi in the grip of the giant gangster. When a lucky dirty hit made the man stumble, Joe bolted with Sachi to whatever path wasn't blocked, deeper into the club, unfortunately. And when Joe threw open a door to see ISA and Kiyoshi being dragged out of a locker, a few guys throwing money back at a druggie, and a 20-something running straight at him with a bag of pills and a switchblade, Joe could think of only one word to describe it. Fuck! At least the man with the knife clearly didn't know how to use it. Joe dodged the stab and grabbed the guy's wrist as a friend had taught him once, then twisted it back and kneaded his attacker in the belly. When the man dropped, Joe dropped with him and punched him as hard as he could to make sure he stayed down. There were four more guys besides the druggie with bleached hair. Two of the guys and the blonde fled immediately. The other two struggled with ISA and Kyoshi but didn't do very well. ISA dug her teeth into her attacker's arm and made him scream, and Kyoshi kicked the other guy in the crotch so hard the man's eyes practically popped. And then would have been a good time to leave, and then Joe could have snuck home with his nose blissfully clean. But no, he'd actually helped Sachi and the others knock out the surprisingly weak dealers. When the last one hit the floor, Joe wondered how the hell a drug deal could get busted by a few teenagers who didn't know how to fight. But then he remembered the deal's protection, protection in the form of a giant man in a hat and shades, and all Joe could think was, get the knife, we're gonna die. He ran back to the switchblade and tried to think of how to fight with it, but he never ended up needing it. Within a few minutes, he realized that the thug had fled. Joe breathed the sweetest breath of his life and dropped the knife to clatter on the floor. Joe? A hand rested on his shoulder. Joe turned to see Sachi and his rescued friends, bruised but more or less alright, watching him in guarded concern. He suddenly realized how long he'd been facing the door with a blade in killing position. Honestly, at that moment, he didn't care if he'd freak them out or not. He shakily pulled the cigarette from his pocket and lit it with trembling fingers. He dragged long. He breathed out, dragged again, and purposefully tilted his head up to blow smoke in Sachi's face. You. He tipped his ashes on Sachi's collar. You owe me the biggest goddamn carton of sticks ever made, ass face. Sachi sighed. For once looking tired, he ran a hand over his face and rubbed a smear of blood from his cheek. What's your brand? Aise didn't sleep much that night. Her first nightmares involved losing that fight at the club, and the next set of dreams, predictably, involved everyone finding out about her little insect problem. It was the last nightmare that bothered her the most, because it followed slightly more than a kiss happening in that closet with Kiyoshi. Kissing. She was dreaming about unwanted kissing on the night drug dealers had kidnapped her. That upset her even worse. She was so disturbed by her subconscious that she lay in bed and stared at her ceiling for hours. The night passed slowly. After the second nightmare, ISA noticed a body in the bed across the room. Her roommate had snuck in at some point, proving that she actually did exist. Aise hadn't gotten a glance at the girl, but in the darkness she could make out bleached hair sprawled across the dark blanket. The room smelled more flowery than before. Aise sighed. She needed to go to the police station after school to look through mugshots. She didn't mind, really, but she knew she was going to be hurting for a nap by that hour. She needed to sleep. Aise pulled her blanket up to her chin, failed to relax, and closed her eyes to see blue and white pills. I'm not going. Sachi looked up from his notebook in surprise. A small bandage hugged the cheek where he'd taken a hit. What? He asked. You don't need me, right? You saw the guys who bolted and the guy in the shades. Joe slumped back in his chair and pushed the rest of his mochi into his mouth. Well, yeah, but why? Joe irritably wiped his mouth. I don't like cops. He let his eyes roam over the room. They profile me, and I hate it. And you never know when they might search you, he added silently. Sachi said nothing. Joe's gaze finally rested on that kid in the back. Zombie, the one he'd seen in the club the day before. Today, the guy was fast asleep on his desk, his head buried in his arms and his dark hair spilling over jacket-clad wrists. He'd been half asleep in homeroom and fully asleep since lunch began. Sachi followed Joe's gaze. He frowned. Man, Sachi said quietly. Kato's been a mess since school started, huh? Joe turned to Sachi. You know that kid? Uh, kinda. Why? Joe leaned in and lowered his voice. Is it true? He asked. He was at the club last night, and they were dealing some pretty crazy shit back there. Sachi squinted his eyes. People are still calling him a druggie? Still? Well, 
People were saying he got into drugs at the end of junior high, Sachi explained. I didn't know anyone here was talking about that. Joe waited. Sachi sighed. <sighs> I don't think so. He lowered his voice even further, then added, He has some problems, but he may have turned to drugs, I'm not sure. What kind of problems? Sachi gently tapped his head. Really? So what? Joe whispered. Is he crazy or something? Sachi's expression hardened. Knock it off, he answered sharply. That's not funny. Joe was a bit surprised at Sachi's shift in mood, but with the funk Joe was in, the change just aggravated him. Joe held his hands out in defense. I'm not trying to be funny, he snapped in return. He slumped deeper in his chair, wallowing in the crappy mood that had gripped him all morning. It wasn't just that cops suddenly swarmed his life. Cops made Joe nervous for obvious reasons, and years of thieving success had made him extra sensitive to the fear of getting caught. No, he ditched before the police had come to question the night before, and there was no way in hell he was going to the station that day. But it wasn't just that. He'd lost another wallet in the club. Well, lost wasn't the word. After he couldn't find his classmate's wallet in school, he'd started packing stolen goods more carefully on his person. He didn't usually misplace anything incriminating, but even pros had their bad days. But now, after another wallet had mysteriously disappeared, he was ready to believe his sneaking suspicion. He'd been robbed. Someone had robbed his spoils. You didn't do that. It was... it was wrong, damn it! He was so pissed at his own carelessness and the nerve of whatever stalker had the itchy fingers that he couldn't cheer up. He mumbled some sort of goodbye to Sachi and grabbed his book bag. He left the class to go to the bathroom and passed Ayase on her way back. She looked like she hadn't slept. She glanced at him but didn't bother with the greeting, and Joe couldn't have cared less. Like he needed Miss Boring's acceptance. Who the hell was she, anyway? She and that idiot roommate of his had started half of this crap by wandering too deep in a suspicious locale. Was Joe the only one on the planet with a survival instinct? His irritated thoughts rolled through his head as he pushed open the bathroom door. The stoner with the orange hair nearly jumped. His cigarette fell from his mouth as he stumbled back. He clearly recognized Joe a moment later and clapped a hand over his heart. Shit on a stick! He let out a breath and shook his head. You scared me, man! Joe bent over and retrieved the boy's cigarette. When the boy thanked him and reached out, Joe pulled it back. This bathroom is disgusting. Do you have a death wish? Joe tossed the cigarette into a nearby sink. Ugh, it was like he was suddenly everybody's daddy. Joe wanted nothing more than to blow off the rest of the day and spend it smoking in a park far away from his idiot classmates. He walked to the urinal and leaned over it. To his great distaste, the stoner followed. Your name's Joe, right? The stoner brushed a wild orange lock behind his ear. You remember me? From yesterday? Joe tried to piss with a classmate hanging over his shoulder. Could you give me some space? He asked darkly. The stoner bounced back a step. Sorry, man. He smiled. Don't mean to crowd. You gave me a cigarette yesterday. I know. Joe tried to keep his patience. If you're going to smoke in the bathroom, do it in a stall so you don't get caught. Yeah, yeah, it's stupid, but I'm claustrophobic, you know? Claustrophobic. Joe rolled his eyes and finished. The stoner followed him to the sink. I'm Seiya, by the way. Seiya Fujisawa. He smiled to Joe's reflection in the over-sink mirror. I heard you pounded Suzuki in some of his pussies last night. That made Joe stop. He turned to Seiya slowly. What did you just say? he asked. Suzuki, you know. Skinny guy with a tattoo, carries a blade but can barely open a can with it. The dealer with a knife. Thinking back, Joe did faintly remember the edge of a tattoo peeking out from beneath the dealer's sleeve. Nice man. Real nice. Seiya flashed his slightly crooked teeth. Suzuki's a dumbass. He thinks he can deal and keep his lame cronies and get a rep for it, but half his money comes from daddy. Seiya patted down his pockets, presumably for another cigarette. He's nothing but a bored rich kid. Hang on. Joe furrowed his eyebrows. Why do you think I got in a fight last night? Seiya laughed. He gave up searching. Don't worry. He purred. You're not any trouble. Word spreads fast, you know, after shit like that. New kid busts up Suzuki's deal, gives Suzuki the beatdown he's been begging for. Seiya knocked his fist into Joe's shoulder. Nice, bro. Joe sighed. He turned back to the sink and unscrewed the faucet. It wasn't like I planned it, he murmured. I don't like trouble. No, man, of course not. Who does? Don't worry. Nobody likes that dickhead. He leaned over Joe's shoulder and Joe caught a whiff of Seiya's smoky breath. But that Sachi kid say too much to the wrong person or something? Joe stopped the water and turned around. Look, he said with lowered eyelids, does this have a point or do you just want more nicotine? Seiya giggled and held his hands out in defense. <laughs> Sorry. He cooed. Don't mean to bother you, you're just getting some attention, you know. We notice good guys like you. Joe paused a moment. Who's we, he asked. Seiya smiled. 
Joe, he murmured, leaning in and resting a hand on Joe's shoulder. Let me ask you something. He flashed his teeth again. You ever think of joining an organization? Joe frowned. Aisei leaned back in her chair and stared up at the ceiling lights. Her seat had that pseudo-padding that barely cushioned her tailbone from the hard plastic underneath. She sighed and rolled her shoulders. No sleeping, she thought, as she blinked her burning eyes. She would be home in an hour, so no sleeping. She had a tiny, stinging pain in her right temple that came and went, something that had bugged her since that morning and wouldn't go away. The longer the day went on, the worse it got. It was stacking frustration on top of her fatigue. You okay? Sachi's hand suddenly rested on her own. Aisei was tired of her space bubble being popped, but she was also too exhausted to care much. She pulled her hand back. I'm fine, she murmured, just didn't sleep well last night. Sachi glanced at Kiyoshi, fast asleep in the chair beside him. Apparently, he said as he turned back to her and smiled. Neither did he. Aisei heard their names called. She looked up to see the police receptionist beckoning. That's us. Sachi shook Kiyoshi gently. Hey, rise and shine. It took a minute for Kiyoshi to start responding like an intelligent person. The receptionist busily typed at her computer as the three of them walked up. Down the hall, she told them over the clicking of her fingers. Last door on the right. Detective Nakajima should be there in a minute. I say yawned as she and the boys followed directions. That burning in her eyes grew a bit too strong to push away. She was so busy trying to dismiss her sleepiness that she almost missed a portly officer pass them on his way up the hall. He brushed shoulders with Sachi, and they suddenly stared at each other. It wasn't a big deal, really. The eye contact between the two of them was brief, almost in that just-happened-to-catch-eyes way that ISA sometimes had with people on the street. The man continued down the hall without stopping, the only difference in his manner being that his head twitched and he scratched his neck with his fingernails. But Sachi faltered. His brief pause left him a few steps behind, so Ayase stopped to turn to him. You okay? she asked. He seemed taken aback, which was a new look on him. He blinked and looked down at her. Huh? She furrowed her eyebrows. What's the matter? Sachi smiled thinly. Nothing. He said. I've just never been in a police station before. Kyoshi rubbed an eye. Didn't you take that field trip in seventh grade? He asked. We've been here. I transferred here in eighth, Kyoshi. Kyoshi frowned. Did you? He rolled one of his shoulders back. It was okay. They gave us donuts, and that was pretty cool. The three of them entered the assigned room in silence, taking in the small rectangular table and half-dozen chairs that awaited them. She and the two boys each took a chair and waited. Aisei winced as her right temple throbbed again. A police officer with a few binders under her arm appeared in the doorway before long. She was thin and older, silver streaked her very neat ponytail. She wasn't particularly tall nor built, but there was something oddly fit about her small frame. You must be the Fukuhashi freshman. Ayase and Sachi nodded while Kiyoshi yawned. The officer joined them at the table, and Ayase couldn't help but notice the silken way she moved through the room. She delicately placed the binders on the table. I thought there were four of you. Sachi bowed his head in apology. Our friend Joe couldn't make it, but I was with him the whole time and saw what he saw. Ah. The woman pulled an index card from her breast pocket. So, Sachi Ishida, Kiyoshi Honda, and Ayase Watanabe. The woman slid into her chair. I'm Detective Nakajima, she said as she placed her hand on a binder. If you wouldn't mind, we'd like you to go through these pictures and see if you recognize anyone from the little skirmish last night. She flipped open a cover. It was very responsible of you to report the crime so quickly, she added with a polite smile. We have a few problematic young men in our custody thanks to you. It's hard to pressure a victim to go through the pains of legal processing, but without cooperation, we can't keep our streets clean. You understand. The three of them bowed their heads. Now. Officer Nakajima leaned back in her chair and leveled cool eyes on Sachi. From the reports, I understand three others fled the scene, but you mentioned a fourth, rather large man from the hallway, Ishida-san. Yes. Could you describe him for me? Sachi thought a moment. He was a lot taller than 200 centimeters, whatever he was. He scratched his head. He wore a baseball cap, but it looked like he had really short hair beneath it, like a buzz or something. He had sunglasses and a little bit of an accent. Nakajima nodded. And his clothing? Green cargos and a black top. Long sleeve or short? Um, long. Nakajima tilted her head and smiled oddly. 
It wasn't unkind, really, nor sarcastic, but there was something very unsettling about that smile. Long sleeves? She asked quietly. Are you sure? Sachi looked almost as unnerved as Ayase felt. Uh, yeah. He blurted after a moment. Yeah, I'm sure. Nakajima pushed her chair back. That will do. She carefully returned the chair to under the table. If you all would take a quick look through those books and see if you find anyone familiar, we would appreciate it. You can take any notes on these. She pulled a few more index cards from her pocket and placed them on the table. All of this shouldn't take more than a half an hour. Okay. As Nakajima made to leave, something itched at the tip of Ayase's mind. Something felt wrong here. The fact that Nakajima was most interested in a perpetrator who wasn't in custody was expected, obviously. But it was something more than that. Something more personal. A small thread of acid swirled in Ayase's stomach. Detective? She called, almost despite herself. Nakajima turned in the doorway. Yes? Ayase cleared her throat. Was she overthinking things? Maybe it was the incident in the club compounded by her lack of sleep, but she couldn't shake the feeling that something was following her. And Nakajima's treatment felt like... a brush-off? Was that crazy? Ayase had never been interviewed by the police before. Maybe a three-minute talk was standard protocol. The stinging in her right temple returned. Ayase winced and rubbed her forehead. I'm sorry, but... that man in the hallway... Ayase tried to think of just how to word it. He didn't really belong with the others did he? Nakajima shrugged. He's someone we've been having trouble with for a while, she replied. She gestured to the binders. And you won't find his picture in there, I'm afraid. Kiyoshi frowned. Well, what do you do about people like that? He asked. Keep a sharper lookout for him. That's about all we can do. Nakajima smiled thinly. Don't worry, she assured them. He'll be taken care of. And with that, she left. As Ayase watched Nakajima go, her small frame padding softly as a cat's, she found herself actually believing that. But it still didn't make Ayase feel better. She rubbed her stinging temple. Joe needed a break from reality that night. Seiya had one of those new handheld consoles that played remakes of old video games, and when Joe had asked about it, Seiya had happily lent it. Seiya was obviously trying to get on Joe's good side. Joe figured he'd get something out of it. These things aren't bad, Joe thought as he laid on his bed. At least they finally put a damn internal light in them. As he beat up midget villains with his midget anthropomorphic amphibian, he tried to ignore the fact that the game system reeked of pot. The irregular thumping over the beeping music reminded him of Kiyoshi's presence. His roommate played with his soccer ball after homework. He was attempting, rather badly, to bounce the ball between his knees. The thump of the ball on the floor was testament of his skills. You play soccer? Joe asked, trying not to phrase it as, you really play soccer? I want to. I did archery through middle school and got really tired of it. Hmm. Joe let out a breath through his nose. That's a pretty different skill set. I know, but I've played soccer with friends since I was a little kid. I'm not great at ball handling. Thump on the hardwood. So I'm keeper. Hmm. Joe frowned at his hero stupidly fell down a pit. You sure you should be doing that in here? Huh? Joe glanced over his game. Our stuff is kind of cramped for- as if to prove the point, the ball leapt off Kyoshi's knee and smashed into the bedside table. The furniture toppled as everything on top of it went spilling to the floor. Kyoshi cursed. Oh, sorry. He murmured as he ran over and dropped to his knees. He righted the table and pushed the drawer back in. Did I break anything? Joe glanced over. He deftly slipped a stolen digital camera from the floor into his sleeve. No. Joe had used his last continue, so he put the game system aside. Sorry about the mess, Kyoshi said, clearly embarrassed. I'll clean it up. Joe had already accumulated some snack wrappers on the table, so he brought them to the garbage can across the room. He noticed a rotten old pencil covered in bite marks among the toppled items and brought it along. Joe had barely reached the trash bin when Kyoshi suddenly blurted, Where's my pencil? Joe glanced up. What? Kyoshi started sifting through the items. Oh, it should be here, he said nervously. I left it, uh, oh, crap, where is it? He stuck his head and both arms under the bed to search. Joe's eyeballs rolled to the bitten stick in his hand. No way. Damn it! Kyoshi pushed himself out from under the bed so fast his head knocked into the frame. He cursed and grabbed the injury as he stumbled to his feet. Maybe I... He yanked open the drawer and started fishing through the contents. He looked so damn worried that Joe found himself asking a rather stupid question. Oi. He held up his garbage. This? Kyoshi's eyes flew to Joe's fingers. The teenager abruptly threw out his hands. Don't, don't throw that away! 
Kyoshi jumped over the things on the floor and ran over. Joe slipped the pencil behind his back and pushed against the wall. Kyoshi stopped, surprised. Joe raised an eyebrow. All right, he murmured. Let's hear it. Kyoshi clenched and unclenched his hands nervously. I uh, hear what? Joe rolled his eyes. Why you care so much about a piece of crap, Kyoshi? Joe sighed. What is this? One of those shitty pencils they give out at tests? Joe held the pencil over the trash. You don't need it. Don't! Joe swallowed a snorted laugh. Kyoshi's eyebrows furrowed. Uh, someone special gave it to me, he said after a moment. It's just got sentimental value, okay? He held out his hand. Can I please have it back? Keep going. Kyoshi frowned. He looked to the floor a moment, curled his hands, and mumbled. It's from a girl I like. Joe instantly knew that Kyoshi, despite his cut body and cute face, had never touched a girl in his life. It was a bit of a surprise, actually. What's her name? Joe asked, trying not to laugh. It was hard. Kyoshi shook his head uncomfortably. Joe, it doesn't... Name? He dangled the pencil over the trash. Kyoshi threw his hands out. My! He cried. My! She went to my junior high and lent me that for entrance exams. He moved in. Joe, please! Joe stepped out of Kyoshi's reach. He ran his eyes over the pencil and said, I assume her perfect teeth made these marks. Kyoshi turned red. Shut up! He snapped. Joe glanced up in surprise. So his little roommate had some bite after all. Have you ever asked her out? Joe asked. Kyoshi immediately wilted. No, I, 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 I couldn't. He blurted lamely. She'd say no. I know she would. Joe scowled. There it was again. He saw it in classmates and housemates all the time. Completely unjustified low self-esteem. If there was one thing Joe had learned over the years, it was that self-confidence was the start of everything worth anything. It pissed him off when capable people were so shy or insecure that they ended up watching their own boring lives crawl pathetically by. It was a pet peeve of his. He'd had a foster father like that. You don't know until you ask her, Joe argued. Did she end up going to Fukuhashi? Kyoshi shifted his feet. Yeah. Then what are you waiting for, lame ass? Joe wagged the pencil back and forth. Quit making out with this disease thing on Friday nights and ask the girl to a movie. I, I don't... I don't make out with that. No, that'd be gross and weird. Yeah, I know. It was a joke. Seriously, Joe, give it back. Please? Joe didn't know what to say. When Kyoshi finally looked up with his puppy dog eyes so unbelievably pathetic, Joe did the only thing he could think of. He ran his tongue along Mai's bite marks. Joe! Kyoshi shrieked as he dove. Aisei tried to ignore the stereo next door. It was loud. Loud enough that the bass made her desk vibrate on the beat. It was already hard enough to concentrate on the assignment she'd been given. It required pages in her textbook that were badly vandalized. The book's former owner had obscured a lot of text with drawings of knives, skulls, and knives stabbing skulls. And her head was still throbbing. She gritted her teeth and rubbed her eyes, wishing that the rock music next door didn't have so much screaming in it. She thought the first knock at her door was a figment of her imagination. The second was slightly louder and certainly resided in reality, so she pushed aside her math and went to answer it. Sachi stood in the hallway. He smiled slightly. Oh. Ayase opened the door wider to let him in. Hey. He still asked if it was alright to enter. Ayase felt like a lot of the formality between them had fallen away. They'd been in a fight together after all, but she was still a little grateful that he was always doing things like that. Like, to prove that he didn't want to make her uncomfortable. It was sweet in a way even if his closeness could be suffocating. She checked her watch as she closed the door behind him. Kinda late, isn't it? She commented. Everything okay? He quickly nodded. Fine. He answered. Fine. Just wanted to, um... He averted his eyes. Uh, hmm. Ayase waited. Sachi ran a hand through his hair before meeting her eyes. Have you seen Kiyoshi tonight? He asked after a moment. Ayase shook her head. Not since the police station. Why? Sachi let out a breath. I'm just a little worried about him. With all this stuff that's been going on, I think he's just had other stuff building up too. And this might make it worse. Other stuff? Sachi gave a thin smile. Girl stuff. He whispered. Everyone who knows Kyoshi knows he's a little lovesick. Ayase furrowed her eyebrows. Sachi had made it sound like Kyoshi was genuinely sick. She suddenly remembered that accidental kiss from Kyoshi in the closet. Her mind had involuntarily gone back to that moment countless times since it happened. Now Ayase saw an opportunity to put it more firmly behind her. 
Who's the girl? She asked. Sachi waved a hand. Someone from junior high. It's not really important. I just felt like checking on him a few minutes ago and he wasn't in his room. I think Joe is teasing him. Is her name Mai? Sachi blinked. You know her? Aise tried to ignore the uncomfortable swirl in her stomach. He mentioned it, she mumbled. Then, can I ask you a favor? I guess. Would you help me look for him? Aise let out a breath. She should have guessed. Sachi clearly didn't sit around when someone could be talked to. Yeah, she said, picking her keys up from the dresser. I can't concentrate until my neighbor goes to bed anyway. He smiled in relief. Thanks, Ayase. He tilted his head a bit. You're really sweet, you know that? Ayase stopped for a moment. She had no idea how to respond to that. She'd been nothing but distant to Sachi since she'd met him, but he was still laying on the compliments? And Sachi's smile, combined with those lazy spikes and the little bandage on his cheek, sent some unusual feelings swirling in her heart. Ayase tried to avoid complete embarrassment by not looking him in the face as they shuffled out of her room. Sachi had already searched the boys' dorm, so the two of them went to check the main school building. Aise agreed to take the top few floors, while Sachi scoured the bottom three, so they chose a meeting place and separated. When she eventually came upon the stairs to the roof, she figured she would be thorough. She headed up the stairs and pushed open the door. It was dark outside. Someone was standing by the fence along the roof edge and looking outward, but at that distance she couldn't tell who it was. She could just make out the boy's school uniform. Hello, he said. Ayase blinked. He hadn't even looked at her. He still stared out into the night. Um, sorry, she murmured. That definitely wasn't Kiyoshi. I was just looking for... She trailed off as he turned to her. She couldn't see him very well, but he looked familiar for some reason. He smiled and cocked his head slightly. Can I help you? He asked. Ayase suddenly realized she was staring. She inwardly snapped at herself and averted her gaze. I'm a... Looking for someone, he's about this tall, she held her hand up to Kiyoshi's height, and has kind of shaggy hair. I think he was wearing- I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Could you come here? Ayase sighed and did so. As she approached him and her eyes adjusted to the darkness, she got a better look at his face. She did know this guy, but from where? He slid his hands into his pockets and smiled down at her. What was it you were saying? He smelled good. Ayase found herself distracted by his cologne and her brain's unconscious desire to place him in her memory. He had a small mole on his chin. Miss? Ayase stopped. Sorry, she mumbled, suddenly feeling really stupid. Uh, I was just looking for a friend of mine. Nobody's been on the roof since I came up. Oh, thanks. She quickly bobbed her head and turned to leave. His hand closed over her shoulder. Hey. He said as his tone grew smoother. Wait a second. Ayase froze. The hand that touched her was covered in thin leather. Black gloves. Are you in class 1D? He asked. Her head throbbed. Ayase nudged free of his grip, tired of being touched by every classmate she bumped into. His cologne made her feel dizzy, which worsened the headache that had bothered her all day. Yeah, she blurted. Sorry to bother you. She half ran to the stairs. She wanted to get out of there. She didn't like the way he looked at her. I wish I could help you, he called from behind. When she turned to glance at him, he caught her eyes with his, and winked. Ayase rushed down the stairs. As she threw open the door to the hallway and ran out, she crashed straight into Kiyoshi. They toppled to the floor and once again Ayase found herself on top. Damn it, her mind screamed as she stumbled to her feet. She yanked her untucked blouse further down her thighs and tried to pretend her leg hadn't touched his hip. Kiyoshi, still on his back, brushed the hair from his eyes. He raised his eyebrows at her. Oh, there you are. He reached for a bag of potato chips with half its contents spilled. Oh man, there they go. Ayase tried to swallow her pounding heart as Kiyoshi stood. He brushed dirt from the back of his jeans and offered the half-empty bag. I, I was looking for you, she snapped. It ended up sounding like an accusation. Kiyoshi shrugged and pushed a chip into his mouth. No, I just went to the lounge to eat. He crunched. Well, I bumped into Sachi and we split up to find you. He said he's sorry he made you wander around. Ayase let out a breath and tried to calm her nerves. At least the roaring in her ears slowly subsided. You okay? Kiyoshi asked. You seem kind of mad. And your face is red. Ayase sighed. I'm fine, she lied. What about you? Sachi was worried about you. Kiyoshi grimaced. He looked away. <laughs>
Sachi worries too much. He mumbled. I'm okay, but I feel bad about hitting Joe. Hitting Joe? Aisei realized she didn't care at the moment. She muttered a goodbye and made her exit. She tried to calm down the entire way back to her room. Her nerves still jumped when she closed her door behind her. They still jumped when she sat on her bed. Despite the hour and her remaining homework, she couldn't get herself to relax. I hate this. Her stomach clenched as she closed her eyes. School had started two days ago. Two days ago. And she already felt like locking herself away. She'd barely talked to boys in junior high, but within 24 high school hours, she'd inadvertently straddled Kiyoshi twice. Worse, she'd felt completely powerless with that guy on the roof. Why the hell had he winked at her? Who the hell was he? Ayase wasn't fitting in at all. Her plan to keep a low profile was backfiring on her. The more normal she tried to be, the more she stood out. She'd come to this school thinking that it would be easy to stay under the radar. The troubled kids who ended up at Fukuhashi High would draw all the attention, right? And she could coast on a BRC average, totally forgettable and out of reach of anyone who could figure out her secret, like she had in middle school. But it wasn't working. The boys were too pushy and the girls were so cliquey that none of them had spoken to her. She just saw them in packs in the hallway. She was left alone to fend for herself against every boy who was drawn to her normalness and isolation, whether their intentions were pure or not. Ayase fell back on her bed. She didn't want to get to know her classmates. She'd already been forced to use her powers in the club, and she never wanted to do that again. People could find out, and they'd... Well, she didn't know what they'd do. Ayase clawed her hair into her eyes. She felt that stinging throb inside her head. Joe stared into the tiny mirror. He tilted it slightly to catch more reflection, then wished he hadn't. He sighed and rested his head on his desk. It's not that obvious. Joe frowned in the circle of his arms. I look like I got my ass kicked. Sachi went silent. That was particularly telling. Joe sat up and angrily leaned back in his chair. Kyoshi's violent reaction to his pencil's violation had left Joe with slashes along his right eye and cheek. Not only that, but Kyoshi had knocked Joe's head into the wall and left a bump Joe still felt. Joe had had a headache from it all morning. He apologized again, Sachi said at last. I saw him when I went to get lunch. He feels really bad, Joe. Good. Joe gingerly touched the scrapes. Cut him some slack, will you? He's really been in love with Mai for years. It's more than just a crush, so don't give him a hard time about it. Joe rolled his eyes. What is this, he thought. Some social healing seminar? He was getting pretty sick of crazy classmates and Sachi's touchy-feely bullshit. Fukuhashi was a government catch-all for the poor, stupid, and parentless. He expected its students to be able to handle a little give and take. What's with the bruise on your chin? Sachi suddenly asked. Did you have that yesterday? Joe sighed and touched the injury. That one had gone from mild to dark in 36 hours. This is from the club, he murmured. He glanced over at Zombie. The potentially disturbed classmate was once again asleep with his head on his desk. Your happy little friend decked me when I tried to talk to him that night. Sachi turned to the sleeping student and frowned. Kado? He called gently, but received no response. Joe twirled his candy bar in his fingers. He wanted a cigarette. He had no appetite. He wondered if his nicotine craving would overrule his desire to avoid Seiya the stoner that afternoon. Seiya was already two for two when it came to being in the bathroom when Joe wanted a smoke, and Joe sincerely didn't feel like talking to him. Girls like chocolate. Joe tossed his candy bar at ISA's desk and leaned further back in his chair. Knock yourself out. ISA glanced up from her homework. She nudged the candy to the furthest edge of her desk. Joe scowled. Oh no, he thought. Ayase Watanabe is sullen today, like she had any other mood. The Kogao Joe had robbed the first day of school sauntered over from the other side of class. Hey. She mumbled around the cookie stick in her mouth. You done with my mirror yet? Sachi handed the cosmetic case back. Thanks. She snapped it shut and raised an eyebrow at Joe. You get into a fight or something? She asked. Your face is all... Wait, you're the guy who spanked Suzuki at the club. Joe dropped his head on his desk. Had everyone heard that stupid story? She slipped the case in her pocket and glanced at Sachi. And you. Sachi, right? She pointed her stick at him. I think someone was looking for you this morning. What? He didn't know your name or anything, but I don't know anyone else who's your height with spiked hair. She threw a look at Joe. Do you smoke? Yeah, Joe answered after a moment. Why? The guy was looking for a skinny smoker, too. You've been hanging out with Sachi lately. Maybe he meant you? Joe stopped. Wait, he thought. Who was looking for us? That didn't have anything to do with Seiya's organization, did it? Were they trying to recruit Sachi, too? Come to think of it, the girl added as her eyes fell on ISA. Keiko! She called to one of her friends across the room. 
Who'd that guy outside the gate say he was looking for? Keiko pulled her chopsticks from her mouth. Uh, I think another guy and girl? Said the girl had kinda long hair. Yeah. The cookie stick aimed for Ayase. Maybe you, then. Joe's blood ran cold. That definitely didn't sound like Saya's crowd. He was suddenly glad he hadn't eaten. He was afraid he'd be sick the way his stomach twisted. Sachi blinked. Um, what did this guy look like? He asked. He didn't look like a student. He was probably in his 20s, real big, wearing sunglasses. The girl tilted her head slightly. Actually, I was going to ask you how you know someone like that. He a friend of yours or something? Joe swallowed hard. Or something. He groped around the bile in his throat. 